I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome, everyone, to the inaugural. This is the first, the inaugural Unashamed podcast with Phil Robertson. Uh, we got uh, Al Robertson, the famously beardless brother, uh, is what I'm known for, which is kind of interesting. I'm the only person in America that's uh, introduced as beardless, but that's because of you guys. And then we got Jace here, who is uh, one of our uh, one of our regulars here on the uh, Unashamed podcast. Jace going to drop in from time to time, give us some of his wisdom. Glad to be here. And uh, and of course uh, the the star of our show, Phil Robertson. Uh, who uh, who you guys have uh, probably been following on Blaze TV. Uh, this is a, a new uh, a beginning for us, you know, and we're coming to you from our uh, command center, the Unashamed Command Center, which is uh, just up the road from uh, where we grew up and where mom and dad still live. By the way, this is the same house that we grew up in uh, as well. So, um, you know. What has that been? 40, yeah, 40 years later. 40 years. Well, you realize it was it was the summer of 1976, we drove right down the road, right here, right just outside where we're at today. Dirt road. Dirt road. Jace, you were you were about to turn seven years yeah, old. Do you I remember? In, yeah, I remember because Phil, as soon as we topped the uh, hill, he said, "We'll take it." <laughs> we, we didn't even make it to the house. He just saw that. Oh, we river. saw the river on it's the left. It's a fantastic view here that we have outside the window. Yeah, we're kind of up on the hill, uh, on the high ground, which these days is, is a good thing. I was eleven. Dad, do you realize you were thirty years old when we first younger, came? Younger than Jeff. Younger than well, much younger than Jeff. He's he's fixing to be forty. Our roots were were, were simple. Uh, it's a bummer that they've now the microbe hunters, the microbe hunters of America. They're everywhere. Uh, they came up with now, and this is scary. You mentioned you were beardless, Al. They've now proven that man's men's whiskers are are have more microbes and germs in them than than dogs' hair. <laughs> really? So, Where did you read that? At? I heard the same thing. I, I saw it yesterday. They said that's all of it, and they had a lot of people with beard. They mentioned. Duck Dynasty and us during the conversation. Really? Yeah, the beard you're wearing, Jace, contains more microbes than a, than, than the hair around a dog's butt. So <laughs> I just want to let you know that. And look, they showed a picture of the three beards, and one of them was Dad's beard. One of them was my my beard. It was Dad's beard. Really? Yeah, that that's, was one. that's a bummer. Well, that's 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 what I'm telling you. So. I was feeling pretty good about it, you know. I mean, it <laughs> keeps your face warm. It protects your face from the sun. Nobody tries to mug you. You got it at a you certain know. age, yeah. and the hair just started coming out of your face. What do you yeah. do? Or you was it put there? We we're 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 creationists. We believe God made the cosmos and mankind. Yeah. Women, not too much hair coming out of their face. Men, a lot of hair. Did he put it there to be shaved off, or did he put it there for protection, whatever the microbe hunters say? I'm just saying men, most of them, have hair coming out of their face. For a reason. It's great camouflage. <clears throat> I think and so. just think of the money that you have saved in your lifetime. And I'm 72, and whatever microbes are in my beard, evidently they're not fatal So, because I'm well, still here. You can lay down with an old Labrador retriever and same stuff going on there both yep. both ways. Oh, yeah. With y'all. I was trying to figure out where you read that because you don't get on the internet. You don't have a cell phone. Fox News. <laughs> I'm oh, sure it was Fox News. Oh, okay. Laura have- Ingram, one of the sisters, she's the one to come up with it. She wasn't buying it too much, but the dude with her, you know. Yeah, I don't know about that. You know, what, Aurora or what? Uh, what's his name? Raymond Aurora. Aurora. He, he came here with no facial hair, and he still doesn't have I any. don't know who all these people are. I, well, I don't know that much about them, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's what they said. So uh, I don't know. Beards are, are good, I guess. If you if you like microbes, uh, I guess that's another reason why I'm beardless. Um, I didn't know that, but that's pretty good. So so a lot of people ask us. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe that the show uh, has been off air now for two years, Duck Dynasty, and uh, that's what kind of put us out there in the in the mainstream, so to speak. People knew who we were which kind of brought the beards out there. So a lot of people ask, well, what do you guys do now, you know, that we don't do that? So just tell them, tell folks what you're into these days, well, two years removed. I travel around the country, uh, not 
every weekend, but a lot of the weekends. And I give a duck call demonstration. Some of them for a nominal fee, some of them for free. But then I share Jesus. I was just last weekend in Marilla, New York. Marilla, New York. I found something fascinating that I did not know. This is breaking news. I found a group of rednecks in New York. There is still hope for the United States of America. I thought you'd like that. Look, the population was like 650, and there were 500 there. So, I mean, this the whole town came out to Marilla. But actually, you know, a lot of these people, I think it was the first time they were introduced to, to Jesus because the last thing they thought they were going to hear me talk about was Jesus. They just thought, oh, a Duck Dynasty dude, he's going to tell some jokes and blow some duck calls. Yeah. And so at the end, I was like, if any of y'all, you know, I laid out my presentation, I made the case for, for Jesus, and about 35 to 40 pretty much bum-rushed the, the stage and said, we're in. So that was kind of exciting. Jace, there's still hope for the country. There is. I got involved in the stock market. You know, I had some money in there. By the way, that, if you had moved south <clears throat> and given that same speech in, in the metropolitan part of New York, New York City. Yeah, it's like it's seven hours from New York City. Seven hours. If you had moved south seven hours and you had given that that speech to the political figures or leadership of New York City, what do you think? They'd have bum rushed the stage, all right. Uh, I might have got a little resistance, but uh, I don't know. You know so I mean? they're repenting and coming yeah. to Jesus in the northern part of New York. Yeah. But if you move south or down in the metropolitan areas, it would be at the risk of your life. Possibly. To, to preach Jesus, his, his death and Possibly. burial and resurrection. Yes. They had a lot of security around, but we didn't need it. But, you know, I really liked that place. I mean, it was a place I could live. I could live there. They were into turkey hunting and, you know. Just... Well, Dad and I spoke in Buffalo or outside of Buffalo. Great response there, too. Exactly. It was packed. Yeah, and... I landed in Buffalo. Right. And then... well, so we were in that same area. I was there a total of about eight hours. I viewed, after we left there, Al, I viewed New Yorker, the New Yorkers, <clears throat> once you see the northern part and the people uh away from the metropolitan area, New York City, once you meet them, you say, you know what? They're, like you said, they, there's good people everywhere. That's right. There's well, common sense, down-to-earth, hard-working people. And you feel sorry for them because they're like us in Louisiana. Most people only think of Louisiana as New Orleans. Like, yeah. it's New Orleans and then every every satellite around that. And, and that's not really true at all. I mean, our culture here in our state is totally different. So, that's true. But they're bound because when we were there, they just passed more – gun laws, which, and it's all aimed at the city, but these poor hunters and all the people, oh, up yeah. the ones you met, they're having to suffer. Well, you know? the biggest applause I got is when I made a reference to that. I think they said, uh, what is your favorite gun? And, uh, I went through a little spiel about, you know, it's basically, you know, the human heart causing the problems, you know, instead of the gun. Well, they all stood up and cheered. So I thought, well, these, these guys up here are so legislated, they can't even these were hunters, you know. I gave a deal on the podcast the other day, and uh, I discussed the fact that if you take the United States in totality and the the individuals who have arms, who are well-armed, high-powered rifles, uh, AR-15, and all of those things, and they made the point, someone did, and they gave it to me, and I looked at it, in other words, America has an armed populace, a standing army, if you will, of individuals. There's 700,000 deer hunters in uh, Pennsylvania, 600 and something thousand in Wisconsin and Minnesota. You're like, this thing turns into a, a, a the largest army armed men in this world. There, and if you added Louisiana going across the South, all the individuals who were armed, his point was, some guy did a little blurb on it, that if someone did attack us, us being as armed as we are, we would be a bone to be chewed. No, on the it, ground? On yeah. the ground. I if, told him that in New York. I said, look, and where I'm from, burglary is not a problem because these people would go, boom, boom, who's there? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you don't. Everyone's armed here. 
Because they're hunters. Don't be scratching on my windows pulling a joke at <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning. Don't do that. <laughs> That's not going to end well. No. No, but it, it's the truth. I mean, they all out, but it, it's when you take all the guns away, then with people with evil intent or people, you know, with mental illness, they they now have literally a bunch of sitting ducks. You know, Where I them. am down here, uh, the scenario would unfold somewhat like this. The dogs would bark. Your guard dogs, they would bark. There's no way to get in here without the dogs barking. Once the dogs bark, that's... It's that's already early, everybody's already yeah, locked and loaded. That's your early warning. Right? That's the early warning and the alert. And, and you can distinguish the bark. Is that a raccoon or is that a person? You we can got tell. it down to is that bark Jimmy Red yeah. or is that someone else? Yeah. They have a Jimmy Red local redneck bark, <laughs> but when somebody they don't know from some other place, there oh, yeah. is a distinct bark. And and I'm thinking. This yeah. is not good. What are they doing down there? And if you look over at your clock, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. So it's dog bark. You wait. And then there's either someone harmless that identifies himself or there's gunfire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, that works. Well, that's, that, it, that's why that people don't scratch around on windows But you know, it's interesting that, that, and that's part of the whole idea behind our podcast is the way of life. There's And there's a lot of people in America the same way. I mean, they grew up in the woods. They grew up on a farm. Their mindset is exactly the same as we are. And yet, if you just got it through television or media, or it was just big city thinking, you'd never even know any of this. Stuff. It, it was, it's no, you completely foreign. What, what, people forget, my- what people forget is we do live in some dangerous times. Yep. And there's a lot of uh, mass shootings for no reason at all except the evil one getting in people, shooting up concerts. It just breaks your heart. Yeah, it's you, absolutely yeah, terrible. And these because these people were not aware that this was fixing to happen and they're not prepared. Right. All we're saying is look, if you're prepared, God forbid that you'd ever have to use your weapon. Right. But at least you're prepared and it is more difficult for for the people who are armed to suffer uh Arm robbery, burglary, and murder. It, yeah, mass shooting. We're, yeah, because basically that's the answer. People call people with guns to come help. They're called right. the police. That's correct. But to finish my thought, what I'm into, I'm still, I still work at Duck Commander. We came out with a new call, and uh, just this past week. But I'm just not in there every day building duck calls. You know, I told Willie, I was like, that's over. I will come in. When there's a problem, I will help design some calls. But Advice and counsel. Yeah. I said, if you want to fire me, fine. But he was like, no, we're good. <laughs> so uh, I'm liking that new position there. I got involved in the stock market, and, you know, I just didn't realize that was going on. I had money in the stock market, and I didn't take note till I looked. You know, they have what they call If I saw wealth. you walking down the road, Jace, yeah. you just wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't appear to me just observing you, you know, you were mistaken as a homeless man when you went in the Trump Tower, sure. yeah. the Trump Tower Hotel. And I couldn't blame him. They escorted you out of the building. I'm just yeah. saying, if I saw you walk by, I wouldn't think this, this guy's big in the stock market. It well, just wouldn't occur to me. I had some money in there and I would just look at the reports they would give me because they have what they call wealth managers. They said, we'll wealth take your money. Managers. Yeah, and they're always, you know, patting you on the back and saying long-term blue skies and rainbows, this kind of stuff. You know, they'll take you and play golf, you know, and they're sending you little gift packs all the holidays. And So I figured they're making some money here, but I kept looking at the reports, and it, they all had a negative mark beside them. And I thought, I thought the point of this was to make money from the money I give you. So anyway, I got involved and they were like, Hey, it's your money. If you want to get involved, took me about two minutes, two months to learn it. And then I started now I'm into it. You know, I've been into it, I guess about four months and they just offered me a job. So Mr. So, Bearded Redneck, you yeah. down in the middle of nowhere, you got a little cash plan run. They want to hire you, Jace. That's what they said. I mean, all of, it's pretty much high stakes poker. Al, and uh, we're living in some strange times. <laughs> it is strange <laughs> that you would look, Jace, the financial, the wealth manager. Hey, I I know more about corporate America in the last four months than I knew in my entire life put together before that. Well, you need to so. explain it to Dad because 
you know, well, when you say stock market to dad. He, I'm just saying if some of these big, big stock market types, you know, all these financial gurus are attempting to give Jace a job, I, we could be in trouble in America. You know what <laughs> well, I'm saying? Well, maybe, though, just the opposite, though. Maybe. Dad, maybe you come in from that whole different perspective and it may be a If whole- you're fearless and you're not greedy and you don't panic, you, you can do this. But if you don't, if you have any of those qualities, if you get anxious or nervous or you get scared when you see something or you have panic tendencies, what stay you're out saying of the stock is, market. If, so you're going to get in the stock market, you go in with nerves of steel. Nerves of steel. <laughs> you, when everybody's selling, you're buying. Maybe that's why all these billionaires you see that they interview, every one of them seem a little weird. Yeah. No, that's that me, weirdness. Somehow you got to be a little weird. No, I'm gonna clear that up for you. The re- see, they're kind of cheating. They had money when they went in it, so they don't make that great of decisions. They just keep dumping money in there, and at some point, they have so much money when they hit on something, I it's billions you. of dollars. I got you. So you know they're not really playing fair, but uh, for the rest of us, you better make good decisions and not panic. Yeah, you can't panic. So, so that's what Jace has been up to. What about what about you, Dad? You're down here on the well, on the side of the river, but you're still making a cultural impact, as they say. Well, what happened was, with the reality show, and the people from New York City and Los Angeles, California, the the film crew and A and E and all of that, without us really realizing it, I did bring it up before we ever agreed to do the show. I told y'all, you if you remember, I said I don't think. A bunch of rednecks shooting ducks. I don't think that people in America is going to watch that. I said they don't even want you to kill a squirrel and eat him. And I agreed with you. Yeah, yeah. And I said, however, I said you guys need to remember we were discussing: do we do this? They've offered it. They said we want to want to film your family, a functional family, just you know, stab in the dark here, shot in the dark. So I said, guys, I was talking to y'all. I said. I don't think it'll work, rednecks shooting ducks. I mean, you know, they got these, you know, few little old things you see. I said, however, if the Almighty is behind it, and he's the instigator of it, and he sent this bunch down here to film us, I said, with the fame that will come from it, I said, he could be providing us a platform, and if he's behind it, it'll go ballistic. Well, I said, but y'all make the call, I'm whatever you think. So y'all talked it over and said, Dad, let, let's go for it. So coming out of that was the platform that was provided for us to give people the good news about Jesus right. and tell them we need to go back to the old ways, like the founder said, hold on to your religion and your morality will therefore stay intact and you'll be a virtuous nation, which we should be, you know, right thinking correct uh, moral excellence we need to get back to the old ways that we were founded on we made plenty of mistakes but we're always going to make mistakes we're fallible but the bottom line is loving god and loving your neighbor is basically what we're holding to so what came out of the tv show it provided us a platform we're basically telling america look or asking america what's what's the downside with loving god and loving each other right i mean we have Life and immortality offered to us through what God did through Jesus. Life and immortality. You would think, and all that's required is you love him. Look what he's done for you, and you love each other. For the life of me, everyone I've ever asked, do you have a better story, and what's the downside to that? They all look at me, whether they're left-wing, right-wing, atheist, agnostic, they always look and say, hmm, you got a point. I mean, you know, it's is there a downside to loving God and loving each other? And life and immortality is at stake. At least we have a chance, That's right. a hope yeah. that God's given us. So I don't see the downside to it. So therefore, I went to Houston first a uh, couple of weeks ago, spoke there at a men's meeting, make better husbands, fathers, which we really need, and, uh, and brothers. So I spoke to them first. <clears throat> I went on up to Dallas, had about two days, full days of interviews, whether it be a radio, a television, podcast. Uh, I met people like uh, uh, 
what's the guy that was on Fox News for a while? Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck. Like Glenn Beck and some of them. Met a guy Chad named Prather. Man. Huh? You did Chad Prather. Show. Prather. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. You just wrote your third book. Wrote the third book. Also, so we which, were interviewing that, The yeah. Theft of America's Soul, trying to get people. I blame the devil, and uh, it's biblical on what ha- what's happened to all the empires. They rot from within. The evil one takes over. They rise to great heights. Then they fall. Most of them are just piles of rubble. And I, we're, I was basically telling them we'll end up the same way unless there's a repentance turning toward God. So we did that. And look, let me say, uh, your first two books were really good. This book, I think, is it's, it's, out the roof. Yeah, it's, it's excellent. I mean, us as Robertsons, way, we don't we don't give compliments easily, but I have recommended that book. I mean, I, it, and it's you, really. And you good. know what's interesting, Jace, is that the the book idea started with with Dad, me, and Zach having a conversation after Trump got elected. We saw people's. It looked like they're just their heads were exploding. Yeah, because they couldn't believe that Trump had gotten elected. And then we just we were watching this and we were saying, man, this what's happening? The country is like it's turned into this different thing, different place. So that that genesis of that, through a couple of years of working on the book, came out with the theft of America. So in the in the end result, to me, was far greater than the beginning because it was much more about just one election, one president. It was, right. it was a bigger oh, it's, picture it's, of the it's event. outstanding, and I like it because somehow or another you captured your softer side in there. I mean, people I think will be surprised in a good way, and uh, you were real vulnerable in the book. I, I just, I just, I think it was really well. We were so, Jace. We were uh, we were promoting the book. We went to New York first, and then we went over to Harrisburg, PA, to an NRA event. And so we're on. We drove, you know, because it's about a two hour drive. And so we're driving along and had a driver to take us over, mom and dad, me and Lisa. And um, I get a call, unknown, on my cell phone. I answer it. And uh, this woman says, uh, <clears throat> this is Madeline from the White House. Uh, is your father available to speak to the president? And I would have just hung up at that moment. <laughs> I, I just, well, I mean, it's, you know, I, and they had told us that they may be calling, so it wasn't like I wasn't expecting yeah. it may happen. But still, when you're actually there, yeah. I said, well, he happens to be right here. So I passed the phone back to Dad, who's in the back seat, you know. And so Dad waits a minute. Then he's like, Mr. Prez, you know. And, they, <laughs> <laughs> and then they have like a, you know, what, 10-minute conversation where uh, President Trump, you know, t- said that Dad was one of the wisest men he knows and – the impact he's making on the country. And it was really, it was, it was for me, it was surreal because I thought about here we are, you know, coming to you from the, our unashamed, you know, podcast uh, command center on the side of the river where we grew up and we came down here 45 years ago. Yep. And now you're riding along and the president of the United States, you know, is calling you on. That's, you that's know. awesome. I mean, yeah, just I compliment heard the that book. Story. Yeah, it was pretty powerful. Which tells yeah. you, if the president would call some joker like me down there on the riverbank, you can better believe he is a man of the people. Yeah. Or he wouldn't give me, you know, 30 seconds of his time. So that told me a lot about the, the president who is in charge right now. Well, and I and, felt better about it, I put it that way. And the idea behind the book, which was the idea is that as a, as a people, if, if we can't return to some sense of godliness that began us, I mean, we will be destroyed, which is basically the point of the whole. The thing. strongest thing Donald Trump has going for him is that he is at least very conscious, conscious of a God in heaven. Right. So he is not anti-God, right. anti-religion. And up until he showed up, it seemed like most everyone else was. You know what I'm saying? Well, and we personally know because, you know, of course, Jason, Willie are friends with Don Jr. and, you know, have known the family, and he's hunted yeah. with us before, but— we know, Dad, because of influential people, men of God, who have been that God has put around the president, yep. and to have those conversations, including you, yep. uh, about who God is and what He means uh, to our to our culture. So, I mean, we we know that that's being done, you know. And so, yeah, that's, what, that's a good what's thing. crazy is how I met Don Jr. was over me getting kicked out of that hotel, the Trump Hotel. Really? Well, because 
you know, I was doing media. He was back trying then to smooth, smooth, smooth it over. Well, a they bit. were embarrassed. I mean, <laughs> that they're like, you know, this Duck Dynasty in your hotel, and y'all are kicking them out. So you, you know, know twenty five hundred bucks a night. You know, you need to be careful who you run out of that. I mean, I was in there five minutes, and so he's like, sends me an email and says, next time you're in New York, we'll take care of you. I didn't know what that meant. But I wanted to see what we'll that meant take we care won't of. run you out of the building the next time. And so the next time I go, I send him an email. And he's like, well, do you play golf? I was like, yep. And they said, well, here, I got you set up at two of our nicest venues, you know. And he said, we'll, we'll stop by and have lunch with you. They had it all mapped out. I was like, hey, I'm in. So I got there. Well, we kind of hit it off because my daughter was born with a cleft lip and palate. Mm-hmm. And what interested them, this is way before his dad becomes president yep. he's like i don't know if you knew this i didn't i don't think he said it quite this way but they're basically one of the largest contributors to kids charities with the same issue you know different charities uh, I, I don't know all the names of them but kids born with some form of clip really? lip and yeah i didn't know that. so that's why he reached out to me oh i've heard the story about your daughter you know we, yeah. we hate that you know uh you got kicked out of our hotel. We play golf. <laughs> then he's like, he's also a hunter. So he's like, when, when are you going to take me duck hunting? Because there's not a lot of ducks, you know, in New York. So I take him duck hunting, and uh, I was so impressed. I mean, this guy can shoot a shotgun. Oh, yeah, he's a hunter. I, I'd say top three gunners that I've ever hunted with. I took that as a really good sign. Oh, that's a very good sign. Because you can't fake that. The first bunch that came in was three, and I thought, I'm just going to let him shoot, see what happens. I said, cut him. He went, bonk, bonk, bonk. All three of them just folded. That's when you said Donald Trump for president. No doubt about it. <laughs> I said Donald Trump for president. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that did cross my mind, Phil. I thought, that's a good sign there. As a duck hunter, I thought, we need this guy in here selfishly. <laughs> well, and then early in the in 2016, uh, we had uh, Zach – you know, had uh, Ted Cruz come down and hunt with us, and I sat next to Cruz. I never picked my gun up, but he never cut a feather. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I figured. Most politicians are like, "Oh, let's go duck hunting," and then you give them a gun and just you make but sure you don't get shot. Cruz was an honest man. He's an honest yeah. man because he would shoot, and when he missed, and then he'd watch me hit him, and he would say, "You're a very good shot." I thought, well. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't pull a sigh. So, by the way, so I go up there, and you say, where did you end up last week? I ended up in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, the last four or five days ago, from Houston to Dallas for a few days, and then you're spending this time talking to him about the book. Ended up in Nashville, and uh, uh, we had met uh, Huckabee, Mike Huckabee, before down there when he was running for president. And... uh, We'd done a couple of events with him. So I met him again, and he, he'd talked to some of y'all. Si had been in now, there. he's for, a good man. He is. Yeah. A godly man. Yes. So I did his show, which was pretty cool. And uh, so the bottom line is, you know, I preached the gospel everywhere I was, his show and all the rest of them combined, you know. So I ended up back down here. We're back down here on the river, and now we're sitting here next to the rising river with rain falling. And uh, – we're back on Jesus. And we're doing a podcast. That's yep. exactly right. Which is really, and just, you know, for our audience, you know, you're, you're launching out with us and uh, kind of want to let you know what, what we have planned. We, uh, we of course, will talk about things that are going on in our lives, uh, current things, things of the past, uh, things that are interesting. The reason that uh, you probably tuned in and watched us or have followed our family, which we're very humble by that, by the way. Um, we don't take that lightly, you know, that people – are blessed. And, uh, I was just in Georgia myself. So Lisa and I've been doing a lot of traveling. Um, we've written three books and uh, we got a new one coming out called desperate forgiveness, uh, June the 4th. So if you want to check that out on Amazon and, and, uh, get you a pre-order on that, it'd be great. But, you know, we just met, a, I met a woman, we were signing books, you know, at the end of the event. <clears throat> and, uh, she said, you know, I was, um, I was down. I think she had had a, some kind of surgery, and so she was down for a while. And I've heard this over and over and over and over again across the country. And she said, Duck Dynasty is what got me through that difficult period of my life. And I've heard this hundreds of times. Mm-hmm. There's somebody had lost somebody, somebody had died, somebody that, you know, they were in the hospital. They were, And the show just was the sort of show that lifted their spirits, which is really interesting because when, when you're doing something like that, we're in the weeds of it. Jay's more than 
more than us, you and I, Dad. But he and Willie and Corey, I mean, they were, you know, you're trying to make it something decent and, you know, you're always having the tension of people wanting to push you where you don't want to go. But you don't kind of realize that it, it, while that's going beaming out there, it's having a huge impact on people because, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a religious show, it wasn't a preachy show. No. I mean, it was just a fun show. But it was there was something obvious about the family and how we felt about each other and kind of how we every episode pulled it together at the end. Of course, the prayer was a huge, you know, signal that we were godly people, you know, and and that's what I hear the most, you know, from yeah, people. Well, it's kind of sad that you're in a situation now where just having a prayer on TV is some needle moving moment. Right. You know, but a lot of people are like, Can you believe it? they're actually praying on T V? And so we're, we're simply trying to uh implement biblical principles and put them in the hearts of Which are our, all good, yep, by the way. Yep. Well and in, in, in our fellow man hoping that uh these principles once applied uh at the centerpiece, love God, love your neighbor to keep this from becoming hell on earth. Right. Because without God, it gets hellish in a hurry. Yeah. Any way you want to slice it. Well, and that's, you said it earlier, Dad, the, the, the Duck Dynasty built us a platform, all of us. And now individually, we're able to go and do sort of the things that, you know, maybe are matter most to us. I mean, Jason, Missy, of course, Chase goes and speaks and just on behalf of the Almighty from, from the Bible, but also, what they've been able to do with uh, Mia and Mia Moo and all the things they've done. I mean, that's a platform, you know, for them. Will and Corey, it's more about adoption. They do a lot of humanitarian stuff. They, you know, help one now. All these great things they're able to do, but they're building orphanages all over the world. I mean, that's their thing. Miss Kay works with all the women who have had abortions, and they, and uh, she does a lot of speaking engagements yep. on why you should give birth to your children, your sons and daughters, and love them. So... It, we're reaching the full gamut. Of, oh, yeah. And then Lisa yeah, like, and I. You all like my wife. I mean, Missy, she has, we have the Mia Moo, which has turned into quite the, yeah, the charity. It's incredible. But she also has this business called Laminin, where she takes women that are coming out of prison and sex trafficking and all these types of deals. And, uh, you know, when they get out, they uh, the one, she's working with other charity organizations where these women who are trying to, change their life, she gives them a job, and they make jewelry. And, uh, of course, the more money they make, the more women they hire. But, uh, you know, you can imagine doing that for the last couple of years, the, the problems and the toughness that comes out of that. But, you know, you see these women who are transformed, and uh, it is an awesome venture. Right. You end up, Al, and the impact for good – Peter was discussing Jesus when he first arrived, said, you know what's happened? This is in about Acts chapter 10, about 30 or so in there. And Peter highlighted two things he did. He said, you remember how Jesus went around, which, meaning, which means it wasn't like going to a structure, the temple. He's turning over tables and chairs at the temple because they had right. made it a money-making enterprise, right. he was going around, hey, went around, Peter said, doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil. Well, if you look carefully at what we do, that's precisely what we do. We go right. around, we do good, and we point people to Jesus right. so they can be delivered from the evil one. Yes, so right. so when, when and we're I, not ashamed to do it, which is kind of the point here yeah, today. That's why we're unashamed. So when I speak to audiences, I have a picture of the last night that we filmed Duck Dynasty. Remember the clip show? We were at Willie's house. So there's a picture that one of the crew took of us all sitting there. Kind of a stately looking deal. We're all, you know, there's you and mom and all of our kids and our family. Was I and, there? Yeah, you were there. Oh. Uh, it was it was the last thing we did, uh, and the crew took the shot. I, I don't even remember. That, I, that I, whole I, thing's like a blur to me. I, I don't know how you remember. <laughs> well, you're, you're a stock market guy now, so that's what happened. But I'll have to show you the picture. It's, it's an awesome picture. So when I show that to an audience, I can see the recognition in their faces. They're like, oh, yeah, that's that's the family. That's the ones we love right there. Your multi-generational faith. I mean, there's Reed and Cole and Sadie and all the, you know, three generations of people doing it and so i said this is a family you love right hey they clap you know and then i pop in a picture of mom and dad me and jace uh jace you were about 
I was seven, so you were about three. And mom's pregnant with Willie. You can tell she's got a maternity top on. So, and you don't have a beard, and you, know, you were 20 something years old. So then I popped that picture in. And I said, this family had no idea that they would ever become the other family. But it happened through transformation. Then I tell the story of how first mom was transformed, then you, and then us, and then how how God built that journey. And so I always tell them, you know, I know somebody sitting in this audience is is that first family. And you're thinking, how can we make it? You know, are we going to be split up or whatever? And then if it's not you, you know somebody like that. It's one of your kids. It's one of your grandkids. It's one of your friends, your neighbors. So then I tell the story of Christ. And so to me, I think that's what has built what we're going to be doing this podcast is 40 plus years now of trusting in God that you can be transformed. And so, and what happened with us, it was the Bible really, you know, first the gospel and then the Bible that has done that. You know, for, for all us. the ones, the naysayers who say it was just dog luck, we're sitting here saying we uh, consider it to be a blessing from God and a direction for a family group to go. So it's one or the other. If it was luck, dog luck, that's a lot of luck is all well, I with, have to say. With me, I mean, you, both of you are, I would consider, gifted at speaking. But when you think about unashamed and we all told about what we did, we go around and speak. My number one fear as a kid was public speaking. You know, in the ninth grade, I took a class called speech. I thought it helped you enunciate English words. They said, no, you get up in front of this, the class and give speeches. I said, oh, I'm out of here. So I got <laughs> up, walked out, and the teacher said, uh, sir, where are you going? I said, no, I'm, this is the wrong class for me. She's like, nobody drops my class, and I just kept walking. And uh, she said, you might as well go walk straight to the principal. I said, that's where I'm headed. And so, so I walked there, and I was like, i got to get out of this class. And he's like, what's the problem? I was like, I, I don't get up and speak in front of people. I'm out on that. And he's like, nope, you're going to have to take that class. And so then I thought, the only thing I got, the only thing I could think of, I was like, do you like crappie? And he said, what do you mean crappie? I said, the fish. He said, I love crappie. Trade off coming. Yeah. I said, well, I can have you two bags of fresh fillets tomorrow if you get me out of the class if you get me out of this class <laughs> look he looked up and he said are you serious i said yes yeah, sir you got his attention he said you're out of the class i'll get you in another one <laughs> he said but i got a question for you i said what's that he said can you pick ducks i said oh i can pick them he said well i need me a duck picker for when the winter gets here i said i'm in just get me out of the class so anyway, make a long story short, I, I was never, you think what I do now, I mean, I spoke last night, you heard me at our local yep, church. Yep. You think, what happened? And when I became a Christian, a follower of Jesus at 14, I had seen your life change. And my my whole view of, of being a Christian was just not doing wrong. You're so, kind of like Moses, I'm, I'm not your man. I'm not your man to speak up about this. So I'll go to high school, first two years, and I just tried to survive. But, you know, as hard as I tried, I still made mistakes, and I wasn't running with them, but I just had a boring, lonely life because I wasn't there going to speak up. So now and you ended up like Jeremiah would say, I just can't, can't hold it I in. I just didn't know what to do, you know, and I was stressed out about it, and I was praying about it because I'd read the verses, and they're talking about all this courage and boldness and, you know, take a stand and be God's spokesman. And I was like, I do not like to speak in front of people. And so one night I get a phone call, and back then it was when the phones were mounted to the walls. You know, you got to get Mine still is. Yeah. Well, there you go. When's the last time you had a call on that? You had to anyway. answer it to know who was on yeah. the Yeah. So I answered, and they just sit there, and I, it was like, hello, hello. And I was like, it's a prank caller. I could hear movement, so I knew it was somebody. I was like, hello. And I was fixing to hang up, and I thought, here I am struggling with sharing my faith and being bold and I got a person calling not saying anything so it just hit me I said you know what I'm gonna do this I'm glad you called you don't have to say a word but I want to share something with you you mean the that, person on the other end of the line never said a word never said a word and look so I get my bible out and I'm all nervous and I start into it you know I start trying to share my faith because I thought this would be good practice for me to get out of this fear of public speaking and they had every opportunity to hang it up and look, you know what? You know what happened? They didn't hang up. And I went on for almost three hours, and they just listened. 
and I could hear the pages rustling. So I know they got a Bible and they listen. And I'd like to have a happy ending to that. And, you know, they never, I finally got tired. I was like, look, I got to go. That's Did all I got. Did you ever find out who it was? No, Jake. I don't know who it was. But look, it transformed my life because I thought, what else could I have talked about? Because all I did was share Jesus and, and what I had just, you know, done two years earlier. Plus, there was a little bit of safety. All they had to do was hang up. All they had to do was hang up. And the longer they went on, the more excited and passionate I got because I thought... And the bolder you got. The bolder I got. And and after that night, which, by the way, when we hung up, I said, call back tomorrow night, and we'll I'll see if I can come up with some new material. And they did. <laughs> and so I went through it again. But... I went back to that school and I said, I'm not going to be quiet anymore. I'm getting past that. I mean, this is not about me. It's you about had a moment, Jace. I had a moment. And uh, when and then you I'm, were, you graduated high school and then you were 19. I was 23 yeah. when we went to preaching school. And yeah. uh, I mean, so you were young. Oh, I was young. I was one of the few that went through high school, you know, following Jesus. I mean, most so people. Jace, as many yeah. as you converted, and you and I all both. But through the year after that that time frame, that person might have been one of them that you. Well, that's right, and it could have been. But what I learned is Jesus and what He offers is so powerful and is so real. It gets people's attention. And then when I started telling my buddies, I mean, because look, I was with the wrong crowd. I just wasn't doing what they you were just doing. Participating, but yeah. I was with all the hunters and fishermen. They were getting drunk every night, smoking dope, you know, and chasing the wildest women known to man. And we're telling me about it, making fun of me because I yeah, wasn't my, with them. You talk about it now. Al Jace talks about when he came to me, his dad, and uh, what most people don't realize, the question was asked, Dad, what are STDs? And oh, I, boy. And I looked down at him. I said, what are STDs? Yeah. I said, have a seat here, son. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Phil, look, you go through all this graphic detail about you know, rotting flesh and dying. rotting genitals. Yeah. I mean, look, here I microbes. am. He's like, let me tell you, at the end, I'll never forget this line. At the, when you got finished, you said, here's the bottom line. Keep that thing in your pocket, and you won't have to worry about it till you get married. That's right. And I thought, oh, boy. Of course, I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but Jace, to this day, Jace, did it keep you from being immoral till you married, Missy? I tell you this, of all the it mistakes I've made, that was one thing I got right. And it wasn't me. It was because, you know, one, you scared me after death. Two, I had put my faith and trust in God. But three, I came up with a system that – that kept me out of that, which was on the first date, they would get in the car and I'd say, look, before this goes on, here's the deal. I love Jesus. I want to go to heaven and I'm looking for a woman that'll help me get there. If if you don't want any part of that, you can leave now. And Jason, look, a couple think, of them did. I think the Almighty is giving you an amen. He did. I, I hear rumble. thunder from the heavens, <laughs> Jason. Awesome. Well, look, we'll my, wife, an amen. my wife, when I gave that speech, she was the only one that said, well, that's right up my alley. And so then I said, if I ever put my hand on you in an inappropriate way, I want you to stop me, which, because I figured now that I'll just tell her that, it'll, it'll, you know, help me along the way. And look, about a year later, she said, hey, you're, you know, remember that little speech? I was like, okay, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, so today our, our inaugural run uh, on Unashamed, uh, we gave you a little bit of background as to, to who we are and why we're here. Uh, and we're excited about the journey uh, that we're going to be going on. It's a journey uh, through the Word of God, uh, through through life change, as we've talked about today, uh, through hopefully things that will impact your life at a direct level. And we're hoping that you'll get uh, other people to listen in uh, because uh, we want people to know uh, what we're talking about. And so... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll continue this next time uh, on Unashamed. Uh, Jace will be back with us uh, next time. And so uh, we gotta, and we'll have old Dan, uh, the butler, uh, and the eunuch. We'll, we'll, when we get him on here, we'll, we'll explain him. He's going to be uh, sitting in with us as well. He's dad's uh, and mom's right-hand man. Uh, I know this, Al. Uh, I'll leave the audience with this today. Uh, being unashamed of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living a godly life in Christ Jesus and pointing others to do the same thing. Al, if you, you cut it and slice it any way you want to, but it has paid rich dividends across the board. That's right. Nothing but blessings came out of being unashamed 
for us and a lot of others out there. Exactly. Yeah. And I, you know, my friends that I share with in high school, they didn't immediately respond, but as the years went by, when they got into trouble, when they knew there was no hope, you know who they called? They called me over that one right. little speech I gave them, which shows you. Yep. This is if you're going to be unashamed, this is the thing Jesus in particular to be unashamed about. So check it out. Um, we'll try to do it again. We'll do a little bit better next time. See you later. So we're so glad you guys were with us today. You can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube or Facebook. And be sure and rate us on iTunes so that other people can know about the podcast.